Hey guys, hope I'm audible and visible. If so, say me a hi. Hello, Suresh. How are you? Hope you're doing good. Am I audible? Am I visible? Just give me a go ahead so that uh, we can start the lecture without any delay. I hope I am fine. Great. So we will be going with uh, lung pathology today. Uh, it's an uh, it's a very short chapter of lung pathology. We will be discussing about uh, the important things in lung. Uh, in the upcoming class, I'll do the GIT and hepatobiliary system as well. Hello, Amrit. Hi, Jaswant. Uh, so, uh, in the topic of lung pathology in Fare, I'll be discussing about these ones, the COPD, the restrictive lung disorders, bronchiectasis, and lung tumors, right? The lung is a very small thing. I'm not including asthma here because asthma is primarily a type 1 hypersensitivity and we saw the type 1 hypersensitivity when we were discussing immunology chapter, right? The same thing of the pathogenesis and a little bit of added clinical inputs, that should be more than enough, right? Hello, Deepthi Narayana. Okay, great. So what we'll do is we'll cover as the uh, topics goes by and uh, first thing will be COPD. COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, right? Everyone knows that. So can anyone comment and tell me what are the things which will come under COPD? What are the things will come under COPD? Under COPD, you will have, there are multiple things under COPD, right? The one of the uh, simplest thing is your emphysema. So emphysema comes under COPD. Your uh, chronic bronchitis comes under COPD, right? So in obstructive lung disorder, when there's a term of obstructive lung disorder, the common denominator here is there's a respiration and airflow limitation. Like, like I always used to say, whenever you're going to go ahead with a uh, long answer question, you always need to have a structured answer type, right? Jafar respiratory distress syndrome will not come under COPD. It's an acute res ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. You're asking about discussion of that? Okay. Um, We'll see it maybe if time permits and hello path. So COPD, it's a common denominator. First, it's not a single disease. It's a group of disorders that goes a definition with a common pathogenesis of airflow limitation. Right? A common pathogenesis of airflow limitation, which results in respiratory failure, right? Perfect. Great Nana port. Emphysema, asthma, bronchitis. Does anyone wants to add one or two more disease to that? of airflow limitation that is the perfect definition of COPD right yes Jeffer most common risk factor of COPD is smoking obviously it is smoking right so like I said COPD has a structure of a very large spectrum of disease actually the way we classify COPD is based on the anatomical structures when the obstruction happens in the bronchus I have chronic bronchitis bronchiectasis asthma asthma also comes under COPD only right when the obstruction happens in the bronchioles I have something for some bronchiolitis that's more of a pediatric illness with respect to sensational virus or pollutants right and then when the airflow happens in the alveoli that's when we call it emphysema right so i have a tiny definition of copd and the copd is going to be based on an anatomical classification i can have the obstruction in the bronchus you have asthma which is also an obstructive lung disorder you have chronic bronchitis that's also an obstructive lung disorder and also we have bronchiectasis ectasia right so it's bronchiectasis that also is an obstructive lung disorder right so after this your uh, chronic bron uh, uh, bronchus we have bronchioles it's the same thing like uh, if you remember your first year anatomy you must have read about multiple divisions of the airway tree right so in bronchioles we have a disease called as bronchiolitis you might have heard about bronchiolitis obliterans pneumonia right boobs say right? so it's bronchiolitis after bronchioles i have the air sac or the asini so the alveoli is called as an asana. Asana we have emphysema. So I know the definition of COPD and I have a slight little description of what all contributes to COPD. Right? So that will be the first part of a long answer question. We have laid down the base. Then the two or three common diseases which we are going to explain here is chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis and emphysema. Asthma like I said we have already discussed in your immunology chapter. I am not going to repeat about that. Fine. So first let's take emphysema. Emphysema, again, if it's a five mark question or be it a part of an essay, it starts with the definition. Emphysema is an irreversible enlargement of the air spaces or asinai distal to the terminal bronchiole. Because only distal to terminal bronchiole, I call it an asinai, and it's accompanied by destruction of walls. The most important thing is use the terms accurately. It's irreversible dilatation of the air spaces distal to the terminal bronchioles right it's air spaces distal to terminal bronchioles because terminal bronchioles is where i have your 
But distal to terminal bronchus, where you have your asana, right? Distal to terminal bronchus, and it's due to destruction of the vessel wall. Okay, due to destruction of the vessel wall, you call it an emphysema. What do you think is the etiology of emphysema? Jeffers said that smoking is a commonest etiology of COPD. Do anyone know the etiology of emphysema? It's same. One of the important etiology is going to, or the risk factor is going to be smoking, undoubtedly, right? So when I say emphysema, I have a perfect etiopathogenesis. So what happens here is smoke, not just tobacco smoke, any smoke in the world can definitely has the capability to destroy the airway. So when it takes smoke in sense, so we'll go to the next heading, tiny heading of pathogenesis. So we'll just write smoke. It's not just tobacco smoke, any smoke in the world. This smoke, once it goes to the lung alveoli or the lung asini, so this asini is going to get destroyed by activation of neutrophils. The smokes can activate neutrophils. So when they activate neutrophils, in the first chapter, we must have read about granule contents of neutrophils, right? Just to revise, can anyone name at least one granule content in neutrophil? Anyone here? Just one granule content. I'm sure you know the multiple granule contents, at least one. One of the granule contents, the important one is your myeloperoxys or MPO. Like that, when I have activation of neutrophils by smoke, there's a granule content which gets released, which is called as an elastase. So it releases elastase. So once my neutrophils release elastase, the elastase comes out. Say, what does elastase do? Elastase will destroy elastic tissue, right? So this destroys elastic tissue. There will be elastic tissue destruction, which causes emphysema. So when the elastic tissue gets de destroyed, it results in permanent dilatation, results in emphysema. It's a very simple thing, right? It results in emphysema. So once I say it's, it's going to result in emphysema, if this pathogenesis is true, am I right in saying that you also inhale smoke? I also inhale smoke? Obviously, right? Both of us inhale smoke. Do we have emphysema? We don't have emphysema. Like I said in the starting, it's not always tobacco smoke, any smoke. Pollution smoke also can result in that, right? So I don't have the problem. The reason why we don't have any problem in spite of inhaling smoke, be it active, passive, anything, we have an anti-protease or a protective mechanism in the alveoli. So this anti-protease is called as alpha-1 antitrypsin. So what happens is when you inhale smoke, be it in, uh, due to smoking or passive smoking inhalation, you will have activation of elastase. This elastase will be destroyed by alpha-1 antitrypsin. Fine? Perfect. Great, Aditya. So here I have two problems. So one is a smoke and I have a protective factor. So when I take the etiology of emphysema, I have two things. Like you guys said, the first and the commonest etiology for is smoking. So when a person is an active smoker, they are going to smoke too much more than what my alpha-1 antitrypsin can take care of it, right? Or other words, there's an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency like Aditya said, right? So I'm going to have an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Which of these two do you think is common? It's a simple question. Smoking is any day common. It cannot even come near a genetic disorder, right? Smoking is very, very common and genetic disorder is alpha antitrypsin is obviously there, right? The most common cause of emphysema or most of the COPD is going to be smoke or pollution, right? So smoking is one of the commonest etiology, commonest being tobacco smoke. So now I know the ETO pathogenesis, we know the definition. Then I have to go to the classification. When you go to the types of emphysema or classification, I told the entire COPD is classified based on the anatomy. I have no other reason for classifying COPD. It's always based on the anatomy. So I tell, I, we saw the definition. Let's assume this is terminal bronchiole. We told that in C, uh, emphysema, the destruction is distal to the terminal bronchiole. Distal to terminal bronchiole, I have a structure like this. We call this structure an asini. So I have an asini distal to the terminal bronchiole. So if this asini is going to get destroyed, how it's going to destroy? I have three different types of emphysema. Actually, four types. One is uh, asymptomatic, we will not include that, I'll, but I'll mention them for sure, right? If the asana is going to get destroyed in the center, what do you guys call it? The center part of the asana getting destroyed. Come on, you can answer it. You definitely know that. In the center part of the asana, you call it centri asana emphysema, right? If the entire asana is going to get destroyed, you call it pan asinar emphysema right it's pan asinar where the entire asana is going to get damaged or destroyed if only the distal part of the asana gets destroyed we call it an distal asinar or paraseptal right we have two terms paraseptal is more of an accepted terminology uh, paraseptal or an distal asinar emphysema okay 
So not just that, like I said, there's a fourth type, which we generally don't discuss, at least for a um, theory exam, you might be required to write. It's more theoretical. As most of the time of postmortem finding, it's asymptomatic, doesn't cause any disease. The fourth type is called as an irregular emphysema. It doesn't not follow any pattern. Maybe uh, you enter into a phase where uh, lots and lots of smoke is there at a particular point of time, not a complete smoker. You enter into a very smoky place, live there for a week, and then you come outside. There's a chance, tiny amount of damage might have happened, but you again come back. So nothing happens there, right? Hello, Rahul. So that's called as an irregular emphysema. Irregular emphysema is asymptomatic, so that's not much required for us, right? So if I have anything which is asymptomatic, I'm not going to much concentrate upon that. Rest three of the emphysema is required. Again, it's an anatomical classification. Every COPD is an anatomical classification, fine? Right. Now let's look at each of the individual thing, few salient features. If you look at the centri SNR emphysema, the center part of the SNR is getting destroyed, right? That's why I'm not that good in Hindi. If you can ask me doubts in Hindi, I'll be able to reply to you. My flu uh, spoken Hindi is not that great, right? So please adjust. My fluency will bit be affected when I speak in Hindi, fine. So when I go to the, let's assume asana as a balloon, I'm smoking or you have put some smoke into the balloon. So what happens is the smoke goes to the most dependent part or the particle goes to the most dependent part, right? So here is where if I smoke, here is where the particle gets deposited, got it? So when it gets deposited in the most dependent part, <clears throat> okay? I call it centri asnar emphysema, fine. Thank you, Rajat. So uh, that's what we call it the centri asnar emphysema because centri asnar emphysema is more associated with smoking. When do you think you'll have pan asnar emphysema? When, you, when the person is a smoker or there's no protection? There's no protection, right? I'll just go up. So if I have no protection here, even any tobacco smoke, any tiny particle of smoke can destroy the lung alveoli. So pan asnar emphysema is seen in places where you don't have much of protection, which means an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Perfect, right? Third is your distal asnar. Again, let's take the concept of smoke only. When a person is going to inhale more, can I say the particles can go to the periphery? Right? This class... This class I usually will get over maybe in a full course. See, Fare series will get over by December end or maybe December first week. The entire course of pathology in the live lectures will get over by November end, fine? So, the November end is where the Fare also gets over. Class also will get over there, fine? Sure, I, must be, I am teaching second year MBBS. There's an entire live course for you in the Meded app. If you're not downloaded, please download that, fine? I should answer your question. Let's go back, fine? So, when a person is going to inhale lots of things, the force of inhalation pushes the smoke to the distal part. So here, the chance of smoke getting deposited is more of the dynamics of smoking. A very young smoker, charming smoker, sends on the force, right? You want to send rings, all those things, fancy uh, types happens in the early part of smoking. Cough happens in the early part of smoking. That's where distal asnar happens. I have much more problem with distal asnar than sentry and pan asnar. We'll look at that very soon, fine? So we said... Your sentry and pan asnar, we look at the subtypes, first two subtypes. I have sentry asnar emphysema and pan asnar emphysema, fine. Okay, so we have sentry asnar emphysema. This is the most common subtype because of the reason, the etiology. It is associated with smoking. Okay. And smoke, generally any person smokes, the air goes to the upper part of the lung, right? So it's more common involves the upper part of the lung. So you have upper parts are more involved, uh, upper lobes of the lungs are more involved compared to the lower lobes. On the other hand, pan asnar is seen, it's rare, but it's seen in associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And for some unknown reason, the lower part of the lungs are more involved. Okay. It's an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Can anyone comment? What other organ can get affected in case of an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? Any idea? Is one more organ which can get affected in case of an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Any possibilities? Liver, right, perfect. So it's not just a lung problem. In alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you will have lung involvement plus liver involvement. So why this required is, see if I'm going to give a long answer question, I'll give you a clinical scenario. A 25-year-old person with a history of emphysema or difficulty in breathing, 
along with liver failure i think of an pan asner emphysema then i go to the diagnosis right so it's just for a diagnosis point of view otherwise it's not much of a concern fine okay that's about the first two subtypes the next subtype like i said distal asner this also etiology is smoking only it's a bit seen in the earlier age group because of the dynamics of the smoke right so when a person smokes and the distal part of the asner is getting destroyed the reason why i call them paraseptalis let's assume this is your branching so here is where the destruction happens it's close to the alveolar septa or the pleura it's very close right let's look at this it's very close here right so it's close to the alveolar septa that's why i call it paraseptal now this the enlarged air sac when i look from the outside it looks like a bulla so the other name for this is an bullous emphysema it's an air sac it's a balloon right can the balloon rupture obviously balloon can rupture it can spontaneously rupture when the person inhales more or some blunt trauma to their uh, chest you fall down or someone hits you it can rupture if the balloon ruptures normal balloon ruptures can you blow the balloon after rupturing you can air will go into the balloon but will it come outside of the balloon no right it will not come outside perfect so because of this bullous emphysema the bullous nature the balloon the bulla can rupture the only complication here is the bulla ruptures and if the bulla ruptures the air enters the pleura but air cannot come outside air just enters pleura when air enters pleura and air cannot come outside which results in a classical finding like what shivam said a spontaneous rupture or a trauma induced rupture right spontaneous not just spontaneous tension pneumothorax right it causes tension pneumothorax tension pneumothorax is the concern here if it's pneumothorax it's a static one right it's a static problem when i say tension pneumothorax each time the patient breathes the air in the pleural space keeps on increasing it's an emergency right how many of you uh, are good doctor fans put your hands up how many of you watch good doctor sean murphy and you want to become a surgeon like sean murphy we all have the dream right so quite a few of you must have watched good doctor the introduction scene of good doctor if you remember in the airport the entire billboard falls and has a tension pneumothorax what do sean murphy do he goes takes an alcohol bottle and pricks there that's a treatment here right the treatment of tension pneumothorax is the air keeps on accumulating when the air keeps on accumulating what happens is it compresses the lung parenchyma when it compresses lung parenchyma i should treat immediately i don't wait for an investigation don't wait for an x-ray immediate clinical diagnosis so my diagnosis here is absent breath sounds if there's an absent breath sounds i know for a fact that okay this patient is having a problem right perfect needle thoracocentesis or i can put an intercostal tube drainage needle is when i don't have much of a resource intercostal tube you put a needle and put a tube the tube will let the air flow out properly right the proper treatment is going to be needle thoracocentesis or an intercostal tube drainage intercostal tube drainage is a very classical treatment for a tension pneumothorax when you come to your final year of mbps you will definitely learn about this intercostal drainage how to do which axillary space and what intercostal space to do right hello himanshu good evening himanshu ramsar fine okay so that's about the third type or the distal snr right so we have three different types of emphysema the fourth one like i said irregular emphysema it's not symptomatic in post mortem i can rarely find here and there a little bit of protruding alveoli i call it irregular emphysema that's all right that talk, talks about emphysema the next step is about next type of copd is chronic bronchitis what is the etiology of chronic bronchitis you guys know the etiology etiology is same smoking smoking is one of the important contributing factor of chronic bronchitis there is one microscopic finding of chronic bronchitis what is that it starts with r and it's in value one microscopic finding what's that it is reeds index right i'm sure you must have read about reeds index one of the microscopic findings is reeds index we don't use it for diagnosis but for a theoretical point of view you have to write it right so chronic bronchitis is diagnosed purely on a clinical basis right it's more than 0.4 perfect sure right it's purely diagnosed on a clinical basis any person who has a persistent cough with sputum production or without sputum production it's chronic it's persistent cough with or without it's with expectoration right it's with sputum production a wet cough with sputum production 
for at least three months and for two consecutive years okay these terms are extremely important and two consecutive years again the most important part of the definition is you'll have to rule out all possible causes which means I am ruling out every other cause which has a etiology which can cause cough with expectation for more. Fine. Great Himanshu. Okay. So that is a possible cause. Like can tuberculosis cause this? It can definitely cause this, right? Tuberculosis can definitely cause it. So before coming into a diagnosis of chronic bronchitis, I have to rule out tuberculosis because tuberculosis can cause cough with expectation, right? So here the most common etiological predisposing factor is smoke. Smoke is undoubtedly the important cause of chronic bronchitis. It's smoke induced damage, right? So let's say you are uh, residing in a room full of smoke. What will be the first response? The first response or you enter a street with full of smoke. You cough and you try to spit out, right? Because all the particles goes and the cilia will hold the particles. Mucus secretion will increase, push out the particles in the form of sputum. Sputum production and spitting is a protective response, that's all. Imagine these patients are sitting or living in the entire room. So what happens is the smoke caused irritation will be permanent. The smoke will irritate the mucosa. So once it irritates mucosa, again this irritation is going to be over the period of years. It's not one or two months. Chronic smoker, chronic chain smoker, right? So this increases mucus production. It not just increases mucus secretion. In addition to increasing mucus production, it also does one more thing. It increases the glands as well. It increases the gland number. This is what we translate into Reed's index. There's more increase in the submucosal glands of the bronchial artery, right? So what happens is Reed's index, the normal Reed's index. So how do we calculate Reed's index? Can anyone tell the formula? How do we calculate Reed's index? Reed's index is the ratio of thickness of the mucus layer and that between the thickness of the epithelium and the cartilage. That's what Reed's index is, right? So it's the, the thickness of the mucus gland layer, the mucus layer thickness divided by the thickness of epithelium to cartilage. Like someone said, the normal Reed's index is 0.4, right? Aditya, right? The so normal Reed's index is 0.4. It's 0.4 normally. So here, as a person keeps on smoking, the amount of glands in the mucosa increases. So the numerator increases. So in case of chronic bronchitis, so what happens is you'll have more than 0.4 reads index, right? As a classical finding, more than 0.4 reads index is diagnostic of chronic bronchitis. But like I said, I don't require this. The only thing I require is you have to go on a clinical diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis which is much, very, very important. Okay. Okay. So now let's go to the differentiated parts. So chronic bronchitis and emphysema, right? Both of these are important COPDs. This difference is there in the Fare book. There are quite good amount of informative tables in the Fare PDF, which is available for you guys. It's free of course. The only motive is to just a fast quick revision. I repeat again, this is not a replacement for you for second year. It's like 250 pages. You can't finish pathology in 250 pages, right? So final, if just before the exam, if you want something concrete and to read and revise, please go through the book, right? So age group, I don't have much of a concern. This is just a variation, but chronic bronchitis can also happen older age group. Emphysema can also happen in anger age group because if it's uh, genetic, obviously it can become anger, right? Dyspnea will be mild and late. Here, dyspnea will be severe and early. The reason dyspnea is a little bit milder is the bronchus is getting involved. And gas exchange is not a primary problem in chronic bronchitis. But in emphysema, whatever destruction happens, happens in the alveoli. So the air gas section is affected. If the air gas section is affected, can I say dyspnea will be more often? Obviously, right? So here, the air gas exchange is a huge problem because emphysema destroys the alveoli. That's exactly at the point of where the most important structure is, right? Cough will be early with more sputum here. Again, it will be late, there will be no sputum at all. Right? So the cough in emphysema, again, is triggered because of the much ballooning of alveoli that triggers nerve endings that triggers cough but in your chronic bronchitis the sputum production triggers cough right infections absolutely common here 
because more and more and more smoke what will happen to the cilia will there be ciliary dysfunction will there be ciliary dysfunction yes the cilia gets affected obviously the infection rate will be more right because this is due to reduce ciliary function because smoke will destroy cilia and it's going to directly cause it fine i'll come to it sure i'll take you a question just give me some time fine so there will be more chance of infection in case of chronic bronchitis, not that much in case of emphysema. Now let's uh, have a look. This part, this infection, right? So if there's a recurrent infection in the bronchus, is there a possibility that infection can lead to bronchiectasis? It can happen, right? Chronic bronchitis, one of the sequelae is another COPD, bronchiectasis. We'll look at, look at that very soon, fine? Okay. So respiratory insufficiency is mostly terminal insufficiency where it is going to cause, if the patient is emphysema is not able to breathe, it will be a terminal respiratory failure, fine. For pulmonary, again, at the end, it will happen. Yeah, it's a bit more common. Airway resistance. When I talk about airway resistance, it will be definitely more in case of bronchitis compared to an emphysema, fine. Here, heart is not a problem here. So what happens here is, in X-ray chest, heart doesn't become smaller. In the chest X-ray, it appears smaller because when I'm going to have lots of big, big alveoli in the lung, the air fields become increased, right? There will be extreme high amount of air fields. That air fields, the lung fields increases, so it looks like the heart is smaller. Here in chronic bronchitis, the obstruction happens higher up in the uh, bronchus region. So the air entry itself is less. So here again, air fields become smaller, so the heart looks larger. It's a very relative finding. There's no cardiomegaly here. Here because of small air fields, it looks larger here, fine? Okay, physical appearance. It's called as blue bloaters and pink puffers. Blueness because of air gas, uh, the uh, dyspnea and everything. Pink puffers. So what happens in emphysema is my air alveoli is already dilated. So my goal is to make sure I inhale more and hold it, right? So what I do is I put extra effort. When I breathe more and breathe more and breathe more, that force is the only one which is going to expand the alveoli even more, more and more. So I have a puff first slip breathing becomes pink because of exertion. That's why I call it a pink puffer. Fine. Okay. Shivam, coming back to a question. It's a very good question. Both of them are due to smoking, but not due to the same variant of smoke. I'll give you a simple perspective. See, I have two different anatomical marks. One is a chronic bronchitis, which happens in the bronchi. The other is which happens in the alveoli. Right. So can I say when a smoke has very big particle size, which you think will be affected, bronchus or alveoli? Big particles. Where will the particles settle? It will settle in the bronchus or it will go till the alveoli? It settles in the bronchus, right? So whenever a person smokes a big particle cigarette or a, cig a, a cigarette without a filter, it stays in the bronchus. But whenever a person smokes a filtered cigarette, a very high quality cigarette, can I say one, all the bigger particles will be filtered by the cigarette and only the smaller particles goes to the emphysema or the alveoli? It does, right? So there is a subtle variation in the quality of smoke or the pattern of smoking, right? That determines whether the person is going to have more predisposition to bronchitis or predisposition to emphysema. Having said that, there is a possibility there are some amount of smoke can be there in both. I'm not saying that if a person is having chronic bronchitis, the alveoli will never be damaged. It can be damaged. But one will be clinically predominant. So I'm going to name that as chronic bronchitis or an emphysema. That totally depends on the way of smoking habit, whatever the person does. Fine. I hope that's clear, Shiva. Okay. So that was our second thing, chronic bronchitis. So once our bronchitis is done, in the bronchitis only I said that you you will have a repeated infection because of the loss of the mucociliary clearance. That leads to the next step of uh, COPD, which is bronchiectasis. What does ectasia mean? What do you guys mean by ectasia? I'm sure you know the ectasia. What do you mean by ectasia? Ectasia means dilatation, right? You must have read about telling ectasia. Tell is the end. Telling ectasia means dilatation of the vessels. Anything which is a ectasia, which means dilatation. So bronchiectasia means it's a disorder of the bronchus where the smooth muscle and the elastic tissue of the bronchus is destroyed due to inflammation and there's a permanent dilatation of the bronchus, right? Again, starting by definition, it's just due to destruction. The salient points which I look for in exam is destruction of smooth muscle and elastic tissue 
in the wall of the bronchus which results in permanent dilatation of the bronchial muscle right? it's it's because the bronchus and maybe to some extent bronchioles right which results in permanent dilatation of bronchus to some extent bronchioles as well okay that's what we call as bronchiectasis right there are few etiological factors of bronchiectasis yes sir, you're right you'll have a barrel shaped chest and uh, pink puffers and emphysema right there are few etiological factors for bronchiectasis but the common predisposing factor is that's a defective mucociliary clearance if the mucociliary clearance is normal can i say infection does not stay in bronchus my cilia has a decent job it will definitely push them outside right that will happen because i need an repetitive infection or inflammation so that the entire bronchus can be destroyed because bronchus is a very thick structure right so one of the predisposing factor is the common denominator is a defective mucociliary clearance that defective mucociliary clearance can be due to many things it could be congenital the risk factors here is let's say cystic fibrosis Am I right in saying that in cystic fibrosis, the mucus uh, will be very, very thick, extremely thick. So I cannot clear them properly, right? It has a very, very, very thick mucus. So even if I have a proper cilia, it cannot push them outside. Or I'm sure you must have heard about uh, Cartagena syndrome. Have you heard about them? Primary ciliary dyskinesias, right? I have a problem in the cilia. I mean, primary ciliary dyskinesia okay. the primary ciliary dyskinesia that also is a problem right or i can have an immunodeficiency syndrome where i have more infection though my cilia is functioning it's not uh, doing its work properly they have primary immunodeficiency disorders like i said the primary denominator is my bronchus is not able to clear things properly so it's not functioning that's all Mnemonic Shivam, I am not a, such a fan of mnemonic. If your friends are here, if they can definitely help you with the mnemonic, that'll be amazing. I'll share it with others. Okay. Emphysema. Emphysema spring puffer. That's how we remember. So if there's anyone which can help with the mnemonic for emphysema, it helps Shivam, it'll help the others as well. Fine. Great. Great. Then I have smoking. Smoking results in acquired ciliary dysfunction. So the ciliary dysfunction can be congenital, the ciliary dysfunction can be acquired also. Obviously, smoking is one of the predominant causes compared to the rest of them, right? I'll have one more possibility. I'm having a bronchus and a bronchial. If there's a tumor obstructing the bronchus, it's a, in the wall of the bronchus, do you think cilia will function properly? Cilia can't function properly, right? Or a foreign body, can cilia function properly? It cannot, right? So it could be a bronchial obstruction also. So is there any bronchial obstruction due to tumor, due to cilia, as well due to tumor or due to a foreign body, obviously the cilia cannot function. The ultimate denom denominator is the cilia is not able to function. Because of that, I am having a defective mucociliary clearance, right? Let's take all of these risk factor. The pathogenesis is very simple and straightforward. Because of any of these, there will be a reduced airway clearance. It's mucus. Am I right in saying that mucus is very rich in proteins? Is that right? Obviously, right? mucus is definitely very, very rich in proteins. So I'm having a defective mucus clearance and it's airway. Can I say it's one of the important thing which results in um, one of the important parts of the body which has maximum exposure to bacteria or virus by inhalation? Obviously, yes. So what happens here is because of the defective mucociliary lens, there is a mucus accumulation. When there is a defective mucus accumulation, okay, so this results in, and it's an airway. Via airway, there will be lots and lots of organisms which enter via the airway. And this organism will be caught up in the mucosa and it stays there. No one is able to clear the mucosa. So it kind of proliferates, it kind of becomes more, right? So this organism enters and due to defective mucus uh, clearance or mucus accumulation, the organisms grow and multiply. 
organisms multiply again the biggest reason for organism multiplying is there's lots of protein content in the mucus which allows the organism to divide if the organism divides these organisms will produce inflammation that destroys the bronchial wall it's an infection related destruction this will increase your inflammation this inflammation will slowly destroy the bronchial smooth muscle and destroys the bronchial wall okay and the elasticity or the wall of the bronchus fine so again it's not a single event whatever risk factor we saw is a chronic process it's not there again and again and again accumulation again and again in division it destroys right so at the end of the day what happens is let's assume our bronchus was like this a perfect normal bronchus here the bronchus becomes dilated let's assume it became like this so here again my mucus will accumulate more and more and more bacteria more and more and more destruction right so this becomes an ectactic dilatation bronchiectasis right now we have to look at the clinical symptom so here what we saw was lots and lots and lots of mucus got accumulated let's assume that this is same bronchiectasis area i'll just zoom this a little bit here is where i'm having lots of mucin accumulation right so is there a possibility all this mucin at one point of time can be coughed outside because it will irritate this bronchus it will trigger a cough response and all this mucus will come outside right so it's a cup like structure which is storing all the mucus because of the defective clearance when it becomes a little bit more irritates the mucosa everything comes outside so when everything come outside the amount of mucus production will it be more or less Aditya Jogren syndrome is a disease autoimmune disorder which destroys your smooth your salivary gland and your lacrimal gland okay obviously when this irritation happens it will be split outside so it will have a copious amount of sputum it will have copious amount of sputum and this sputum production is very very important so the clinical history here will be you will have a cough with copious amount of sputum production and it's not once an event it is obviously chronic right the so chronic cough with copious amount of sputum production so our goal is to diagnose either i'm going to diagnose with the help of an uh, radiological imaging or in your pathology you will have specimens it you will have definitely specimens which which should, you should diagnose it right so when you have a mounted specimen of the lung the gross appearance here is if you have a lung here you might have definitely had bronchiectasis specimen in your uh, pathology lab you'll have multiple dilated bronchioles here or bronchus here multiple dilated thing on a cut surface you'll have multiple dilated bronchioles here so how do i diagnose them as bronchiectasis and how do i know it's not normal so normally from the pleura up to 2 cm you won't see any bronchiole right so normally up to 2 cm from pleura because this 2 cm will have only alveoli there will be no dilated structures so when you have a dilated structure within 2 cm of the pleura it's an ectactic dilatation not normal fine i hope you understand that let's take that this part of the lung is normal so what happens here is it will have tiny 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 bronchus and alveoli i won't have dilated structures but within this 2 cm if you have a dilated structure like this i call it ectactic dilatation or bronchiectasis right that's a description of bronchiectasis grossly in the lung the best way to diagnose bronchiectasis or the investigation of choice is obviously hrct high resolution computer tomography hrct of the thorax which can easily say that okay there's a dilatation there's no dilatation right it can be easily uh, identified that's how you describe bronchiectasis fine that's the part about bronchiectasis the treatment is take care of the infection if possible if the etiology is uh, we can take care of the etiology for example smoking try to prevent smoking cartilaginous no i can't do anything cystic fibrosis can't do much of thing if the congenital problem i can't do anything if it's an acquired problem like aspergillus can predispose i can take care of that i can treat them right that's how we treat okay that's about bronchitis let's go with a long answer question yeah. tram track appearance can be shown obviously in your capacity fine so read about this read this question and tell me what you think about it i want any everyone who's online to comment on the answer if it's right wrong it's fine you're just going to learn that's it
diagnosis. I'll read through you. 58 year old retired factory worker. This is a uh, question stem from Fare book only. So most of the long answer questions with respect to systemic pathology and hematology will be in the form of a clinical case scenario, right? So we'll see how to approach this clinical case scenario, how to write the clinical case scenario, right? Whenever you have a clinical case scenario in your pathology exams, first thing is, please understand as a teacher, I don't want you always to write the correct diagnosis. That doesn't matter at all. My goal is not always correct diagnosis. So you take the data points and just analyzing how you are thinking. That's more than enough for me. Correct diagnosis never required. Give differential diagnosis if you want. But if there's a clue, I want you to pick it up and at least close the differential diagnosis. Right? Let's go with this. Sure. TB is obviously a good choice, right? In, in respiratory system, TB is obviously the first one. Okay, Rahul has gone with silicosis. We'll go one by one and see what it is. 58 year old retired factory worker. My thing is here, I don't know which factory. We'll look into it. Persistent dry cough, dull chest pain, and unintended weight loss of 7 kg over the past 6 months. This is an important clue for me. Which of the disease you know will have a very significant weight loss? We'll take. Uh, Options, Shivam was given an option of TB, silicosis, emphysema, lung cancer, which will have significant weight loss. Of the four options, he said, which will have significant weight loss, TB, silicosis, emphysema, lung cancer. Okay, we'll read through the question, right? He has smoked for the past 30 years. So here, this is a very important history for me. I'm having a long history of smoking, 30 year history of smoking. TB will definitely have a significant uh, weight loss. I'm not denying that. 30 year history of smoking, is it required or important for diagnosis of a TB? First thing, unlikely, right? We'll read through it. Physical examination means fatigue, decreased breath sounds on one side, tenderness on chest wall palpation, and non club finger appear appearance. Fine. Great, Manish. We'll look into it. Chest x ray disclosed a sizable mass in the right upper lobe with associated pleural effusion. This is also important for me. When we went through, CT scan showed and 6 cm mass in the right upper lobe with mediastinal lymph node enlargement. Right? Diagnostic procedure, everything was done, the probable diagnosis. Again, I'm going to ask you, we'll just uh, understand how to write an exam, in an exam, right? So this, this is a question here. The first thing I want you to write in any exam is, be it hematology, be it systemic pathology, if there's a case given or be it microbiology, I want you to write the data points given and what led you to the diagnosis? Because this is how I want a young undergraduate to think about. First important thing is age. 58 year old. That's important for me, right? And this is 30 year history of smoking. Because when you write, always you will come up with a solution. Your mind automatically will enable the unimportant points. Okay? Then you have a significant weight loss. There is no sputum production. It is more of a dry cough. I'll come to it why it's important for me. Right? Then on X-ray and CT scan, there's a mass in the upper lobe. And CT scan also said that along with the upper lobe mass, there was a mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Okay. So with these significant things, now can anyone tell me what's the diagnosis? Shivam, are you still with TB? Or do you want to remove TB and add on something else? If you're wrong, it's completely fine, right? You need not be worried at all. If you feel it's wrong, remove the comment. No one cares about it, fine? Okay, what do you, what do you think is the diagnosis? What do you think is the diagnosis? Okay, Shivam has gone for cancer. Others? 58 year old, 30 year history of smoking, significant weight loss, and you have a mass in the lung. So most probably, my diagnosis, lung cancer. Okay. Most probably my diagnosis is lung cancer. Fine. Rahul, like I said, you can write squamous cell carcinoma of lung, but I would say it's very specific. Go to lung cancer. Because you're not wrong in calling it lung cancer. But I don't have a very pressing history to definitely say squamous cell carcinoma. It can be adeno, it can be neuroendocrine. Right? So it's more of a generalized diagnosis, much better. Maybe write below subtype. For subtype, you need histopathological examination. You can add on to it. Right? Now let's go on. So we had two more differential diagnoses. We'll see why it is not the answer. First, we'll go to your uh, Shivam's tuberculosis. The reason why I am not thinking in terms of tuberculosis is 
TB will have dry cough or cough with expectation. That one point which is for me slightly against tuberculosis, right? Will TB have a mass? It won't have a mass. It might have a cavity. It will not have a mass, right? TB will have mediastinal lymphadenopathy. That will be there, right? So I won't have a mass or I won't have a dry cough in case of tuberculosis. So I am ruling it out. The reason I don't think of a silicosis is I don't have a classical history of silicosis. It should be an, a person who is working in a glass manufacturing industry. Silicosis will have persistent cough. Silicosis can present as lung failure. But silicosis might not have a 7 kg weight loss. Significant weight loss will not be then silicosis. Interstitial lung disease, yes. Silicosis do not have a mass. Silicosis will have a fibrotic area. It's a silicon module, right? It's fibrosis, right? So those are points for me for against silicosis. Uh, it can still be, but I'm giving a differential diagnosis here. Now, the next part helps me. So most of the time, when you have a long answer, there's a clue given. I've written there classified lung tumors. So obviously the diagnosis is going to be lung cancer only, right? So classified lung tumors, sometimes if the exam is good, they'll give everything for you. If the examiner wants to be a bit more stricter, they'll say classify the disease and describe the etiopathogens and the morphology of the disease. That becomes a bit difficult for you, right? So for any question in your long answer format in micro or palm or pathology, if it's a case scenario, please form a table. You write whatever name you want. But I want you to put the salient points. That one helps you to come to a correct diagnosis. And they also know that, okay, I'm, I'm dealing with a, a person who has a logical reasoning. That's all. Like I said, even if you make this wrong, I'm not going to penalize because the way you're doing it is right. Fine. Yeah, Shivam, uh, like I said, it's 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 not wrong. It's fine. TB still can be there. I'm not saying TB will always have productive cough. But if it's TB still, my first thing for me for TB is think about fever. Fever, night sweats is something which I classically give for an undergraduate for TB, right? So keep of that and uh, you can have the suggesting points. But there are a few salient points. Don't ignore that, right? Yeah, see, Rahul came up with one more answer for you. Yes, obviously, cavity will be there in squamous cell carcinoma also. Again, the classical findings. For a TB template for an undergraduate, it's about uh, fever, night sweats, weight loss. If that's there, go with that, fine. Yeah, Aditya, you're right. Clubbing will be there in quite a few lung cancers. That's why I, I didn't want to subtype the lung cancer. We can subtype also the lung cancer. There are a few lung cancers which cannot have club, which don't have clubbing. So it's predominantly lung cancer for me then let's me do a histopathology to say it's small cell or non-small cell or large cell right so it's just a lung cancer carcinoma that's all right now let's classify lung tumors when you classify lung cancers evening suggest they have different possibilities of lung cancer one yes Rahul small cell carcinoma is neuroendocrine carcinoid atypical carcinoma and small cell carcinoma right we have squamous cell carcinoma, we have adenocarcinoma, we have neuroendocrine carcinoma, neuroendocrine tumors in such, in under neuroendocrine tumors we have carcinoid, you can have a subtype, you can call it a carcinoid, carcinoid is also a cancer, it's a low grade malignancy, have atypical carcinoid. And I have small cell cast your small cell carcinoma. Okay. And obviously, the last undefined category, large cell carcinoma. Large cell carcinoma, like I said, is not much important for us. It's more or less an uh, undifferentiated carcinoma. Just for namesake, since I'm asking classification, complete that as well. Right? Okay. Now, when I take lung cancer, I know a little bit of classification here. That was the first part of the question. Classify the tumor. And talk about the etiopathogenesis, right? Almost every tumor's etiopathogenesis is more or less same. Smoking is definitely one of the important etiology for lung cancer, right? So when you look at squamous cell carcinoma of lung, now you have to again structure. I have a 10 mark question or a 15 mark question. In a 10 or 15 mark question, 3 4 marks goes for the diagnosis part. The first part is a classification, which will take 2 marks. Most of the time, when you have multiple answers there, it will be written in brackets 2 marks, 3 marks. So based on that right, don't elaborate too much lengthy, make it like 5-6 pages. Honestly speaking, 
I don't have patience for a person who writes six, seven pages in an exam hall for a long answer versus a person writes crisply for two pages, three pages. Amazing. That's enough. It'll cover everything. Fine. I'll go to Yatya. When you go to neuroendocrine tumors, I'll give out the overall difference between carcinoid, atypical carcinoid, and your small cell carcinoma. Fine. So when you take squamous cell carcinoma, etiology of squamous cell carcinoma is obviously smoking. It's more a crude variant of smoke. It's a non-filtered smoke. Okay. So when I take the pathogenesis, the levels HIA will be for uh, carcinoid syndrome, fine. Okay, Shivam, carcinoid is a neuroendocrine tumor, right? So can I say GIT has uh, G cells, which is a neuroendocrine tumor? Yes. G cell is a neuroendocrine cell. So I can have neuroendocrine tumor there. So wherever I have neuroendocrine cells, cells which secrete in response to neural stimuli, those are the neuroendocrine cells. Can I call beta cells of pancreas as neuroendocrine? It is. So wherever I have neuroendocrine cells, I'll have neuroendocrine tumors. Carcinoid can be seen in lungs. Carcinoid can be seen in your GIT. Carcinoid can be seen in pelvic organs also. It's a neuroendocrine tumor. That's all fine. Are you all tell me what question the doubt it is. I hope I have answered all the doubts. If I missed it, please comment again. Fine. Okay. Let's look at the pathogenesis. So when a person smokes with respect to your uh, squamous cell carcinoma, the smoke deposits in the bronchus. In the bronchus, the first change what the smoke does is it causes something called squamous metaplasia. This makes you un makes the examiner understand this person exactly knows how squamous cell carcinoma goes. Fine. I am not able to see your question, Paliwal. Just can you please reply back? Right. So once, once there is a squamous cell carcinoma and then still the person smokes persistent. Smoking continues. It needs a very long history of smoke to perform in cancer. Okay, I will do it. Telegram is a bit of smack, spamming. So I am a bit moving away. But can you please ping me on uh, the Instagram? It's much more comfortable with less spams. Or you guys can pick me on WhatsApp as well. So I'll try to uh, answer queries. I'll definitely go to Telegram and I'll uh, try to answer the queries here is left. Fine. Okay. So if you want WhatsApp, 7760157195. So ping here. I'll definitely help you in uh, answering your queries. Fine. Okay, great. Let's come back to this. So you have smoking here. So once smoking persists, it results in dysplasia. So whenever dysplasia is there, again it persists, it results in squamous cell carcinomas. Right? It's going to result in squamous cell carcinoma. Okay? There are multiple things here. Fine. So that's my pathogenesis. So smoke resulting in squamous cell carcinoma. Then I want few classical clinical features. Clinical features can be common for every cancer. Hemoptysis, weight loss, cough could be any of the clinical features, right? So when I take clinical features. There are few things which are specific for squamous cell carcinoma right that here. Clubbing is more specific. Or I can have hypercalcemia. Okay. Hypercalcemia is a classical finding seen in squamous cell carcinoma as a paraneoplastic syndrome. I can definitely have patients with clubbing, right? So again, I might have cavities on x-ray. Like Rahul said, cavities on chest x-ray is a classical finding for squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. And they are mostly hilar or central lesions. Again, that's a classical finding for squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. It's more close to the bronchus because it's there, fine. Uh, Palival, uh, drawing a microscopic image, it might help you in fetching more marks, but I would say keep it simple and more descriptive. It's not the beauty what I want. If you can put a box and say squamous cell carcinoma will have Keratin pearls with a little bit of cells here. Keratin pearls, just right. Keratin pearls because that's the microscopy I'm going to see in case of a squamous cell carcinoma, right? Use the neosin hematoxin, just random things. It has to be just descriptive, that's all. Uh, metastatic calcification, see, it can have cal uh, hypercalcemia, will definitely have metastatic calcification if it's been there for a longer time, right? Again, uh, Shivam. It's about the location. I'll just give you a uh, probability. Let's say there's a lung bronchus. 
am having a tumor which grows here in the hilar region, right? Can I say it's obstructing the bronchus partially? This partial obstruction of the bronchus can it cause the mucosillary clearance to be reduced? Can it cause productive cough? It can, right? At the same time, when I have a tumor here, not related to the bronchus, it might not cause a productive cough, right? So it's based on the location. Yes, I can have a cough, I can have a tumor without a cough, also fine. Okay. So here, gross appearance of every squamous cell carcinoma remains the same. They are proliferative lesions and they are pearly white. Every squamous cell carcinoma will be pearly white proliferative lesions. That's diagnostic. Right? Next, microscopy. Microscopy, like we said, is keratin pearls. This word is enough. Keratin pearls are diagnostic of squamous cell carcinoma. Then obviously I have immunohistochemistry. I see you have P40 and P63. These are two markers which are diagnostic of it. Okay, Sarivan, like I said, uh, a microscopic image, it's totally based on a person's skill of drawing, right? You can draw the salient points required for you. Like uh, for me, dysplasia, if you have some pleomorphic cell and keratin pearl, I am more than happy to say it's a squamous cell carcinoma. The student knows about it. It's not the beauty of it. It's a salient points which is required. For an adenocastma, draw glands little bit uh, weird weird cells this uh, pleomorphic cells that's enough you won't you not be artistic you need to be descriptive that's more than enough fine right? so when it comes to adenocastma adenocastma is the most common tumor in the lung most common primary tumor of the lung or primary malignancy adenocastma can be seen both in smokers and non-smokers Uh, for me, if it's point wise, I'll be more than happy because point wise helps me to less. Uh, point wise is much easier for us to rather than being exactly booked. Two salient points, like I said, in TB, I would expect uh, the points of uh, fever, weight loss, night sweats to be there. That is important for me. Two terms are important, need not be exactly in the terms of a book, fine? Uh, we have gone. Uh, from moved away from school days. School days is where I go memorize NCRT and write whatever is there in NCRT, right? It's not like that. And it has lots of variations in medicine. If you can highlight the salient things, common findings, more than enough, fine. Right? Okay. I wish I can. If I am an examiner, the first thing I do is first is 50%. Anything you write beyond that, it's extra above 50%. It never starts with zero, right? So smokers results in a fine variant of smoke. The fine variant of smoke is that the smoke reaches alveoli and the alveoli becomes a cancer which results in adenocarcinoma. That's a pathogen of smoking induced adenocarcinoma. In a non-smoker or a person who is a passive smoker, right? The non-smoker predominantly is due to mutations. Mutations cause pathogenesis in a uh, non-smoker related adenocarcinoma. There are few mutations which I want you to write. Keras is must. You can have EGFR. EGFR is the most common mutation in lung cancer among Asians. And you have ALK1. Because of this mutation, again I have dysplastic cells which can result in adenocastma. So I am sorting out both the pathogenesis simultaneously in smoking and a non-smoker. Right? So when I go to adenocastma gross, since it's smoking related, one goes to the alveoli. So they are generally tumors which are seen in the periphery of the lung. They are peripheral tumors. They are mostly single lesions, single and irregular lesions, which is close to the alveoli. That will be the gross appearance, right? Obviously, Rahul, Keras is the most common proto-oncogene mutator, right? It's seen in multiple tumors. They have some irregular lesion like this, close to the uh, pleura, right? So next here, when it comes to microscopy, it's an adenocastma. We can have glands. Glands is a pattern. There will be four features of dysplasia. If you want to write the four features of dysplasia, the pleomorphism, high NC ratio, mitosis, same thing. The pleomorphic cells lining them, high NC ratio and everything, right? Mitosis, loss of polarity. And obviously, you'll have invasion of basement membrane. That makes it malignant, right? Invasion of, I'm writing BM for basement membrane. Again, if you want to draw a diagram, 
put a square, put a field, and draw irregular glands with lots of very appearing cells. Like I said, it's not about the beauty here. It's about what I want to convey. So I have drawn cells. I know it's malignant because of the pleomorphic cells. And then I have few cells which has invaded beyond the alveoli into the interstitium, which comments about the invasion. If you want, put a mark here and write. It's an invading the base membrane and has come to the interstitium. I know it's a cancer, fine. The amino acid chemistry for lung adenocarcinoma, TTF1, napsin A. I don't think so. This napsin A, TTF1 is there in Robbins. But it's important for every diagnosis in uh, which comes to the lab. TTF1 napsin A is very, very important for me to say. It's adenocarcinoma of lung origin. Because in lung, metacells are very common. Most metacells are adenocarcinoma. So I have to prove that it is different from colonic adenocarcinoma. Well, I need this, fine. Next, we'll go to your small cell lung carcinoma. But in general, I'll talk about neuroendocrine tumors, fine. Okay. Muc1 is a very good marker. If you want to add, you can add for sure. Okay. So I want to divide them. So neuroendocrine tumors has carcinoid, atypical carcinoid, And we have small cell carcinoma. Carcinoid is a low grade malignancy, but this is also malignant. It's a low grade malignant. It's not a benign tumor. Fine. Atypical carcinoid is intermediate and this is the most aggressive lung cancer. Okay. So atypical carcinoid is between intermediate. So carcinoid here. It, uh, small cell carcinoma doesn't have any specific locate. Carcinoid most commonly they are endobronchial lesions. Atypical carcinoid, the location is not that much important. It can happen in the lung parenchyma, wherever it is. But carcinoid is mostly endobronchial. Carcinoid on microscopy, how do I differentiate them? Is carcinoid is a very classical pattern cousin, nesting pattern or organoid pattern of tumor cells. Atypical carcinoid, no pattern. It's just diffuse sheets of tumor cells. In small cell custom also, I'll have same sheets of tumor cells. I don't have a specific pattern. It's becoming, it's growing much faster. Sheets of tumor cells. All three are neuroendocrine. One common finding for every neuroendocrine tumor is the cells will always have an salt and pepper chromatin. This is common for every neuroendocrine tumor. There's no difference between carcinoid, atypical, or small cell carcinoma, right? But obviously, I need to know the difference between these two, right? Immunohistochemistry is also common because all of them originate from the same neuroendocrine cell, right? So I, there won't be any difference in IHC as well. What makes a difference for me is here there'll be no necrosis, low grade, right? But here necrosis present, here also necrosis present. So obviously, I need some more difference for me to say. It's not atypical carcinoid. The difference between atypical carcinoid and small cell carcinoma of the lung. Fine. This comes your mitotic count. 2 to 10 mitosis count per 10 high power field. HPF stands for high power field. Uh, the 40x slide in the microscope, you have a blue color lens, 40x. That's your high power field. In 10 high power fields, if you have mitotic count of 2 to 10, I call it atypical. Less than 2 for 10 high power field. I call it typical carcinoid, more than 10 or 10 hyperfield, I call it small cell carcinoma, right? I tell you ask for difference, these are the differences. So I can exactly say by counting mitosis, low grade, intermediate or a very aggressive tumor, right? Okay, that's just to end one more mic classical point in microscopy, we have something called azopardi effect. Azopardi effect is a classical finding seen in small cell carcinoma, it's a very aggressive tumor. So what happens is very vascular. I'll have lots of deposit of the tumor cells. I call it an um, asopardi effect, right? What do you see? Can anyone comment on the immunohistochemistry? I'm sure you guys know the IHC. What's the IHC for any neuroendocrine tumor? Most of the neuroendocrine tumor has almost similar IHC. You have the same thing. It's common for every neuroendocrine tumor. Synoptophysin. Don't forget this. Chromogranin. There are multiple things. There is bombesin, there is NSE. Okay. I have neuron specific enolase. There's CD56 and CD57. Right. 
there are multiple multiple immunohistochemistry available so all this can be useful uh, you said you read about neuroendocrine tumors in the GIT the same marker profile the same microscopy so wherever I have neuroendocrine tumor I'm going to have the same finding same microscopy the only difference is the cell of origin and the location and the symptomatology fine right? carcinoid syndrome is a bit unlikely in a um, carcinoid of the upper GIT it's a bit more common in the lower GI carcinoma fine right? perfect just few words regarding the large cell carcinoma. So when you take large cell carcinoma, large cell carcinoma, like I said, it's more of an un, um, it's not much of a mature tumor. So I'll have large anaplastic uh, cells. That's all. It's more of an undifferentiated tumor. The newest classification calls them as an undifferentiated carcinoma. I don't know whether it's becoming squamous. I don't know it's becoming uh, adeno or it's an uh, small cell or as a neuron it's a very undifferentiated tumor right so they have extremely large pleomorphic cells with a vesicular nuclei a okay, large extremely large cells extremely pleomorphic with vesicular nuclei vesicular nuclei is not be blue in color it'll be more of a clear nuclear which is vesicular right it can be an undifferentiated part of squamous, undifferentiated adeno or undifferentiated small cell. That's all fine. I can have a little bit more undifferentiated cells as well. It could be, it could be a neuron, it could be a uh, spindle cell type, it could be a clear cell type. It's not differentiated, right? Uh, it has a poor prognosis because I don't know what they are. So it's just to end up with more high mitotic or and everything. It's an undifferentiated tumor. That's it, fine. Yeah, you can add on to it the paraneoplastic syndrome of small cell carcinoma. Uh, Dipne, uh, I'm okay with Dipne, but like I said, uh, I would more concentrate on your Cushing syndrome and other uh, SAADH. That will be more uh, important for you than Dipne, fine. Okay, so whatever we saw till now is a summary of uh, all the lung cancers, right? So here, lung cancer, I'll just go up. So you know how to diagnose a lung cancer, small cell carcinoma. It's a crude variant of smoke like a BD, settles in the bronchus, causes metaplasia and becomes a cancer in the hilum or the bronchus. So since it is in the hilum, it can irritate the mucosa, cause a sputum production or without sputum production or hemoptysis. Since it is hilum, it has more space to grow so it grows bigger. Since it grows bigger, there is a possibility of central necrosis. That's where you will have the cavity in the x-ray. High dilation, cavity in the x-ray, hypercalcemia, all of them are classical of it. Fine. I'll end with this Rahul, fine. So proliferation, proliferating mass, most of them is white in color because keratin is white in color. That's what it is, fine. And microscopy has keratin pus, immunohistochemistry has P40 and P63. So adenocastma, it's a most common tumor smoker or non-smoker. Smoker related, fine variant of filtered smoke. The cigarette goes to the alveoli. It causes a tumor in the alveoli. It can irritate there and cause cough, non-productive cough. Adenocosma causing a productive cough is very, very, very unlikely, fine. It produces non-productive cough. Then you have a, uh, which causes adenocastoma here and alveolar mass. So when you have a non-smoker, mutation related thing, the, those are three classical mutations I don't want you to miss, which results in the adenocastoma in the alveoli, right? Then I have gross. Gross will be a peripheral lesion, single lesion and very irregular because of the location, because of the smoking etiology, it goes to the periphery. Cough is the most common finding here. It might be a little bit diagnosed delayed because it will not cause hemoptysis, right? Microscopy will be glanced, the same four feature of dysplasia and your invasion of basement membrane, okay? Okay, fine. So in uh, IHC is your TTF1 and NAPSN8. So small cell carcinoma of the lung, they are raised from the neuroendocrine tumors. There are three different types of tumors, carcinoid, atypical and small cell carcinoma, aggression, low grade and highly malignant, Location is endobronchial and carcinoid. Other two can be in any location in the lung parenchyma. Few findings. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Mitotic count is where I can clearly say it is the uh, carcinoid, intermediate or small cell carcinoma. And asopardi effect, if you want, you can add to it. Like Rahul said, I have few paraneoplastic syndrome which are classical for small cell carcinoma. Cushing's will include your dipne and also you have your uh, uh, SAADS, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Fine. And IHC is your these. And large cell carcinoma is just a wastebasket category. If it's uh, it's not having any uh, differentiation, I call it large cell carcinoma, fine? Okay, so those are things they wanted to discuss in lung pathology. I'm cutting it short by a little bit time because I, I know that you have a um, uh, class for you in the uh, in the PWR. So 
we'll definitely learn more things uh, uh, whenever time permits next class we'll be completing the rest of it and after this uh, number 30th if the things are over and still you guys want to have some lectures i'll be more than happy to answer your question fine so any doubt in today's class if not we'll call it a day so entire thing will be there in the foray i hope you must have downloaded the app and that's freely available for everyone so please go through it fine okay So thank you for your time. If there's no other doubts, we'll call it late. Fine. Thank you. Bye bye. Go for your live class. I I this pharmacology microbiology. Whatever it is, go for that. Fine.